Lauren Alamina is the central character in the novel Parable of the Sower. She is a young teenager living in 2024, and she sits in her bedroom with her friend Joanne, contemplating all that is troubling in her world. She lives in a gated community, one that is surrounded by violence and is increasingly imperiled. Her youngest brother will soon be killed by a gang, though she does not know that yet. What she knows is that other young people, people like her, face new forms of violence daily. The world is dark. Drugs have become commonplace, and a new drug called pyro in this sci-fi world that the novel portrays, it gives people pleasure in watching things burn. And older adults worry constantly about work. Her parents argue about whether to move to a community to do manual labor for a company. They worry that it will not pay enough to feed their family. Joanne sits at the edge of Lauren's bed, eating a three-bean salad and acorn loaf. Lauren asks Joanne if she's ever considered that the gated community that they live in may not hold, that one day they may have to go beyond it. I think we need to study everything that we can find, to read books, to be prepared, she says. Joanne is frightened and even dismissive of the prospect. So we learn to eat grass and live in the bushes. No, says Lauren, we learn to survive in a new world. Umar Hawk has written a challenging piece in the magazine Udemonia and Company. The title is somewhat hyperbolic, admittedly, but I think it is written in that way in order to provoke thought. It is called Why We Are Underestimating American Collapse, The Strange New Pathologies of the World's First Rich Failed State. Huck argues that three failures are unique to the American experience, failures that have not been seen before and that are fraying the American social fabric. His article was published in January, 19 days before the Parkland school shooting. It is a propos, then, that one of the symptoms of collapse that he identifies is the escalating number of school shootings. As he puts it, America has had 11 school shootings in the last 23 days, which is more than anywhere else in the world, including Afghanistan and Iraq. Some have challenged this particular number after reading his article, noting that not all of these instances were massacres. But that argument, I think, may actually prove his point. Nowhere else in the world are people arguing over which of the last 11 school shootings are tragedies. It is a unique experience to our cultural moment, a horrific and terrifying symptom of a deeper illness. The second symptom that he points out is the opioid epidemic. This is another one that is unique to the American experience. The reason is that in many countries of the world, opioids are more accessible than they are here. In fact, in parts of Asia and Africa, you can buy them over the counter. But we do not see the levels of abuse there that we see here in the United States. As Hawk puts it, So the opioid epidemic, mass self-medication with the hardest of hard drugs, is again a social pathology of collapse unique to American life. 
The last of the three symptoms that he identifies is a phenomenon that has only recently come to my attention. I admit that I didn't really know about it before this. It's a reality of a large number of retirees who move from one low-paying job on to the next, often living in nothing but an RV or even out of their car. Jessica Bruder wrote about this in fuller detail in her book, Nomad Land. She describes a whole population of the elderly who've had their savings wiped out after the Great Recession in the late 2000s and whose houses have been foreclosed upon. One such 70-year-old woman travels from town to town, working once at a Walmart during the holidays and another time on a farm picking berries. Bruder stumbled on this reality unexpectedly and was surprised to discover it. Call me naive, she writes, but when I see an RV, I assumed it's owned by one of the last great pensioners enjoying retirement and going to see the national parks. I regarded it as a life of luxury and a neat retirement choice. After all, they call them recreational vehicles. But she continues, I started doing some research and learned that there is a whole spectrum of thousands of employers hiring people in similar situations in oil fields, harvesting sugar beets, and helping out at amusement parks. These are not easy jobs or the kind typically associated with people in older stages. But nobody had been looking at this in the context of the retirement crisis in the wake of the Great Recession. Hawk notes that the first two phenomenon, the school shootings and the opioid abuse, are not exactly news from nowhere. Indeed, people have been noticing these for some time. A lot of ink has been spilled since Columbine about school shootings. And since the late 2000s, articles and books and documentaries have announced the increase in prescription abuse. The problem is that we have failed to notice them from a global perspective, which is what shows them as unique. Instead, newscasters have written about these issues as if they were just part of our new reality, par to the course, just an, an, just an inevitability that we now have to contend with. But from a global perspective, school shootings, widespread opioid abuse, and the displacement of elders is strange, bizarre, almost dystopian. It is deeply foreign. And because of this, it should give us some perspective on what may be going wrong in our culture. So what, then, is the unifying factor that unites these three symptoms? What deeper illness are they pointing towards? Hawk argues that it is widespread social indifference. The fact that we can watch children being shot and people dying from overdoses and elders struggling to get enough food suggests a deep-seated pathology of indifference. As he writes, indifference is a pathology, but it is one of the soul, not one of the limbs like the others that he's already mentioned. Americans don't appear to be too disturbed, moved, or even affected by the other pathologies above. Their kids killing each other, their social bonds collapsing, being powerless to live, with dig uh, to live in indignity, or having to numb the pain of it all away. Something is deeply wrong here, he says. And I think he's right. Now, if I had to name the single most important voice in late 20th century speculative fiction, I would make a strong argument for Octavia Butler. Has anybody here read Octavia Butler before? A few people. She's definitely worth reading. She wrote about a dozen novels before her untimely death in 2006. Parable of the Sower and its follow-up, Parable of the Talents, 
are two of her most popular. And the details in these two books are uncanny, maybe even slightly prophetic. A recent article in The New Yorker noticed the parallels between her 1990s novel and present reality and dubbed it prescient. Butler was born in 1947. Early on, she knew that she wanted to write. Her parents warned her that it would be tough, that her race as an African-American and her class background would make success in this field unlikely. But she persisted. And her work went on to win both the Hugo and Nebula Awards, the highest honors in science fiction and fantasy. Her books are a complex blend of science, politics, and spirituality, and they've inspired a generation of writers and artists. Black Panther, the film that opened this week, actually represents a movement that Octavia Butler started in her fiction, the movement called Afrofuturism. Beyonce's Lemonade also claims Octavia Butler as inspiration. The title, Parable of the Sower, is an obvious reference to the biblical story of seeds being spilled on different kinds of soil. Most of them fail to plant. Only a few of them spring up. But a lot of the novel is focused on the seeds that fail to take root and why it might be that they fail to take root. Parable of the Sower is one of her darker works, I think. In fact, it became so depressing to her that it took her 10 years to follow it up with a sequel. She came to view the novels as warnings of the future, warnings that, it turns out, have eerily familiar details. If you need proof, I will offer this. In this dystopian world where the social fabric is starting to fray, two forces compete for the presidency of the United States. One of these is a demagogue who utterly lacks meaningful policy suggestions but is able to whip crowds into a frenzy. Can you guess what his campaign slogan is? Make America Great Again. Parable of the Sower was written in 1993. Lauren Olamina, who I mentioned at the beginning of this sermon, is the protagonist of the novel. And the first half of the book might be seen as an exercise in discernment. There's a clear separation of those in Lauren's community who are able to recognize the problems and to think about solutions and those who refuse to see them at all. Some think that a leader will come and who will make um, things go back to the way that they were. Others believe that the status quo they're currently living in will last. Lauren is one of the few who recognize that the world is changing, and in order to accommodate it, she knows that she needs to be ready, and she needs to think proactively about the future. In the novel, Lauren is called a sharer, a trait that makes her feel the pain and pleasures of others, as if that pain and pleasure were her own. In the novel, this isn't exactly a romantic notion, but rather it's often portrayed as a liability. Seeing the pain of others can be paralyzing to her, and it often makes her want to just shut it off. But it is also no mistake, I think, that this trait shapes the protagonist in the novel, Lauren becomes the person in Parable of the Sower most likely to create an alternative to the future that the characters are facing. And this is in large part because of her empathy. Her empathy. Feeling the pain of others is a part of what shapes her worldview and her ability to create positive change. Umar Hawk wrote that if there is one thing that is pulling at the threads of the American social fabric and causing these different pathologies to rise up, it would be indifference 
the inability to reach out and feel the pain of others. For him, it is the indifference of witnessing the problems of shootings and drug abuse and the abandonment of elders and not caring enough to really do anything about it. I can't help but wonder about Lauren in Parable of the Sower. She is determined to create a community of people who care about each other in spite of all the destruction that is happening around them, in spite of all the things that are tearing at the fabric of her society. And she is someone who cannot help but to feel what others are feeling, experience what they are experiencing, and then begin to build something out of that. One of the things that is giving me the most hope right now are the students who have survived the Parkland school shooting. Their shared experience of destruction, violence, pain, and their determination not to allow others to experience what they have experienced is causing them to act for a better world. I saw one meme on Facebook this week that put it this way. The Parkland students have forced a CNN town hall, forced commitments from Marco Rubio, squeeze the President of the United States to, provoke, to propose a bump stock ban, pressured advertisers to stop funding the NRA, crowdsourced millions of dollars for a march. It's been nine days. This, to me, is deeply inspiring. As another person said recently, first came the women, then came the children. The future is here. Get out of the way. I hope that's true. And I think that a part of the early success is that, that these students are having is that it is inspiring people to feel again about these issues, to touch upon their empathy, which has been numbed by so many of these situations happening with so little prospect of change. They are stirring our indifference and pushing it out of the way. They are bringing us into deeper empathy with one another around this issue. And it makes me wonder, what would it look like if we start to bring our full feeling selves to the problems that we face in this society? Rather than try to hide our inclination towards empathy, what if we embrace it as a gift? If indifference is leading us into something of a dystopian reality with unsavory symptoms, perhaps this act of sharing, of reaching out and embracing the vulnerability of others will open up new possibilities for a future we have yet to imagine. The philosopher Judith Butler put it this way, that empathy might return us to a sense of human vulnerability to our collective responsibility for the physical lives of one another. I hope that that's true. I want to hold on to that as a possibility for how to move forward in the midst of the problems we now face. It's a start. Perhaps it is ground more fertile than the indifference that we are so used to. I would say there are seeds yet to be planted. What will we do with them? Amen. I love you and blessed be.